The search is for two young friends, inseparable according to their parents. From about 6.30 last night, they seem to have vanished without trace. Anyone who's got children must know what we're going through. Give them back. Just give them back. Just put an end to all of this for them. They're too young to be going through What this. must they be thinking? It's bad enough for us, but we don't know where they are. You don't know where they are. But someone's got them. They're Stop not their back. children. They're our children, and we want them back. Located in Cambridgeshire, England, Soham is a charming town known for its picturesque surroundings and a close-knit community. It boasts outstanding schools, pedestrian-friendly streets, and a steadfast commitment to safety. In many ways, it's the perfect place for raising a family. Soham was also home to Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells. Both were born in 1991 and lived their entire life in this town. They also went to St. Andrew's Primary School, where they became best friends. At around noon on August 4, 2002, Jessica went to Holly's home at Red House Gardens for a barbecue. She recently bought a necklace with an H engraving during a family vacation, and she planned to give it to her best friend, Holly, that day. When Jessica arrived, she and Holly spent the afternoon playing video games and listening to music. With both being huge football fans, they also changed into matching red Manchester United jerseys. Holly's mother, Nicola, found it adorable, so she snapped a photo of the two before they had dinner with other guests. After eating, the two headed back upstairs to play at around 6.10 p.m. However, they didn't stay there for long. At 6.15 p.m., they left the house without informing anyone to buy sweets at a nearby sports center. Unfortunately, they never returned home. At around 8 p.m., Nicola went upstairs to invite the girls to say goodbye to their guests. To her surprise, they weren't there. Anxiety gripped her as she and her husband frantically combed through their house and scoured the nearby streets, desperately searching for the two. Still unable to locate them, Nicola contacted Jessica's parents to ask if the girls were there. They weren't, so Jessica's mom, Sharon, tried to call her daughter on her mobile phone. However, it was switched off. Troubled, they decided to report their missing daughters to the local authorities. At about 10.30 p.m., the police arrived at the Wells residence and gathered as much information as possible before beginning their search within the local area. Word spread in the community about the missing girls. This prompted concerned citizens to volunteer in the search efforts that evening. One of them was the Soham Village College caretaker named Ian Huntley. At about 11 p.m., he bumped into Jessica's mother while they were searching within the school grounds. When asked if he saw the two, Huntley said he didn't. Moments later, the police tried to enter a hangar inside the campus, but it was locked. Being the caretaker, Huntley was asked to open it, but he claimed he didn't have the keys for that, so the officers moved on. With their daughter still missing, the Chapman and Wells couples decided to hold a press conference on August 5th, 2002. Along with police officers, they earnestly appealed to the public for assistance in locating Jessica and Holly. What I'm appealing for at the moment is anybody with any information about the whereabouts of these girls to come forward, to contact us, out in Soham wearing red Manchester United shirts, quite distinctive, and somebody must have seen these girls. If they have, please contact us. The press conference by the grieving parents resonated deeply within the community of Soham. Soon, even more people came out to volunteer in the search operations. It's just this feeling that you can't stay at home. You, you want to come out and help and try and do something. The nearby Sussex police officers also stepped in to help. As interest in the case grew, National media outlets flocked to Soham to provide coverage. Multiple news organizations also initiated reward offerings for any information concerning the whereabouts of the missing girls. Despite the efforts of volunteers, the monetary rewards and heightened media coverage, Holly and Jessica still weren't located. As more time passed, officers grew increasingly concerned that this wasn't merely a case of the girls running away or getting lost. They began to fear that the two must have been abducted I'm a realist. I know most children would have been seen, would have made contact with an adult, would have phoned home. They would have done something to bring attention to the fact that they are away from home. We've had nothing from these two very responsible young girls. My gut feeling is that they have possibly come to some harm. By August 7th, the investigators started searching for evidence of kidnapping. That day, 
They seized a suspicious white van that was seen in Soham on the night the two went missing. Unfortunately, this yielded no significant breakthrough in the case. That same afternoon, some of the police officers went back to Soham Village College. While there, Huntley casually approached them. Out of the blue, he asked Officer Sharon Gilbert how long DNA evidence typically lasts. He also remarked that a previous caretaker had left under dubious circumstances and may still have keys to the college. As they talked, Gilbert grew suspicious of Huntley, so she called the inquiry line that evening to inform the other investigators that they should look into him. I wanted them to know that he was a person that they needed to have interest in, and it was serious. He'd done something that he was covering up with the way he was talking, and they needed to be interested in him. On August 8th, investigators released CCTV footage from the Ross Pier Sports Center. This was recorded on the night of Holly and Jessica's disappearance. The footage revealed that the two arrived at the local sports center at 6.28 p.m. The investigators then asked around that area if anyone had seen them that night. Eventually, one man came forward and said he had. Ian Huntley. He claimed he spoke to them briefly before they headed to a public library. Because Huntley turned out to be among the last to have seen them, the media decided to hone in on him. Brian Farmer of PA News Agency went to Huntley's home to interview him and his girlfriend, Maxine Carr. As it turned out, Carr once worked as a teaching assistant at Holly and Jessica's elementary school, so she personally knew them. In the interview, Farmer asked Carr if the girls had been taught not to get into cars with strangers. When she said yes, the reporter followed it up. He asked how she thought the two would react if a stranger invited them inside a car. Before she could respond, Huntley interrupted and gave an oddly specific answer. Well, Holly would probably get in and be quiet, but Jessica would fight and go mad. And I remember thinking then, how can he know? The couple then proceeded to recount the details of their interaction with the girls on August 4th. Huntley claimed he was cleaning his dog outside the house when Jessica and Holly passed by. Meanwhile, Carr was inside. The girls then asked Huntley if Carr was doing okay, since she didn't become a regular teacher at their school. According to the couple, this was the extent of their interaction with them that night. Farmer, however, was unconvinced. He left that interview feeling that Huntley was involved in Holly and Jessica's disappearance. Later that day, Huntley gave another public interview, this time to BBC News. It's, uh, it's just very upsetting, you know? And to think that I might be the last friendly face that these two girls had to speak to before something's happened to them. For the next several days, police responded to various reports about possible sightings of the two. However, none led to anything substantial. On August 13th, the investigators received a tip from a jogger who spotted what appeared to be recently dug graves in the Warren Hill area near Newmarket. Hello, police investigating the disappearance of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman are searching an area of woodland near Newmarket in Suffolk tonight where they found two areas of recently disturbed earth. Chapman and Wells' families were informed of this serious development. In addition, they were also advised to prepare for the worst. The entire nation anxiously awaited the outcome of the investigation in Warren Hill. On the morning of August 14th, police officers confirmed that the mounds of earth in that area were just badger sets. Additionally, they affirmed that the location had no links to Holly and Jessica's case. The news brought relief to everyone. Hope remained that the girls were somehow still alive. However, the public was also growing frustrated with the police officers by this time. It had already been 10 days since Holly and Jessica's disappearance, but there was still very little progress in their case. That afternoon, David Beck, the officer in charge of the case, made a surprising move by making a televised appeal to the kidnapper. I appeal to you again to work with me to stop this getting any worse than it is. You do have a way out. I have left you a personal message and a text message on Jessica's mobile phone. Listen to that message. It will tell you how to contact me so that we can stop this now. The real reason for that appeal was to persuade the kidnapper to turn on Jessica's phone. This would then allow the police to pinpoint their exact location. On Thursday, August 15th, given the team's limited success in the search and rescue operation, a 
a leadership change occurred. Detective Chief Superintendent Chris Stevenson assumed command and initiated a fresh approach. Investigators then enlisted the help of mobile expert David Bristow to analyze the data from Jessica's phone. With his assistance, they established that Jessica's phone was turned off on August 4th at 6.46 p.m. within the vicinity of Ian Huntley's residence. The police were astounded by this discovery. To check which particular cells were serving uh, me on that route. Uh, and I noticed that the one area where Jessica's phone might have been served uh, by the Burwell cell site was that area which I get a put a red dot on the map. That red dot was right outside Huntley's house. On August 16th, the investigators held a press conference to announce the most significant update yet regarding the case. In the last few minutes, a 28-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman, both from the Soham area, have been spoken to by police officers and have agreed to give witness statements to us. Ian Huntley and his girlfriend, Maxine Carr, were taken to separate police stations for questioning. They also allowed the police to search their home at Five College Close while they were being interviewed. Investigators immediately noted that the house had been meticulously cleaned. This only made them even more suspicious of the couple. In the police station, Huntley was calm, but showed hints of being uncomfortable while being interrogated. Carr, on the other hand, was more bubbly and confident. Nonetheless, both stuck to the same story they told journalist Brian Farmer days before. After the interview, both were released and taken to a nearby hotel. Little did they know that the testament they gave would soon fall apart. As news outlets focused more on the couple, several people came out to speak against them. One of them was a woman from Grimsby. She asserted that Maxine Carr gatecrashed her birthday party on the night of Jessica and Holly's disappearance. The celebration took place at a venue about 110 miles from Soham. Because of this, Carr couldn't have possibly been in her home on August 4th. As proof, the woman forwarded pictures of the party to a journalist. Carr was undeniably present in many of the photos. These pictures were then submitted to the investigators as potential evidence against the couple. Then, on August 16th, as police went through Huntley's residence and the school where he worked, they made their most significant discovery yet. Two charred Manchester United jerseys. The very same ones that Jessica and Holly wore. They found it in a trash bin at the hangar in Soham Village College. Huntley previously said he didn't have the keys to that room. After the discovery, it became apparent why he tried to keep the police from searching there. With this major breakthrough, the local authorities moved in to apprehend the couple in the early hours of August 17th. In the last few hours, a 28-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman have been arrested. By this point, the investigators were convinced that the girls were most likely already dead. The search operation was now about finding their bodies. At around 12.30 p.m. on August 17th, a pair of bodies were discovered at a drainage ditch in RAF Lakenheath in Suffolk. Both were already in an advanced state of decomposition and had indications that the assailant tried to burn the victims. Investigators then retrieved the bodies for autopsy. On August 18th, police officers held a press conference to deliver a heartbreaking update. We are certain, as we possibly can be tonight, the two bodies, that they are those of Holly and Jessica. Holly and Jessica's families have been told this terrible news. The news sent shockwaves throughout Soham as the entire community mourned for the tragic fate of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. I, I, I'm terribly upset. I can't imagine what their parents are feeling. But they do know that we are with them, and we will always be with them. It's terrible. It's shocked everybody and so on. It's been a terrible, terrible two weeks. Awful. Nine days later, on August 30th, 2002, a public memorial took place at the Eli Cathedral in honor of Holly and Jessica. More than 2,000 people attended in a show of solidarity. Meanwhile, the investigators continued to gather more evidence against Huntley and Carr. As they dug through the couple's records, they made startling discoveries. It turned out Huntley had had several run-ins with the law. In 1996, he was charged with burglary for breaking into a neighbor's house in Grimsby. Moreover, between 1995 and 1996, he had illegal and intimate relationships with several younger ladies. In April 1998, 
He was arrested on suspicion of engaging in a non-consensual act with a woman. Somehow, he was never prosecuted on any of those charges. In February 1999, he met Maxine Carr at a nightclub in Grimsby, where they were instantly attracted to each other. Within four weeks, Carr moved in with Huntley. By June 1999, their whirlwind romance culminated in their engagement. However, their relationship wasn't always sunshine and rainbows. In fact, there were many instances of Huntley physically and emotionally mistreating Carr. She even tried to break up with him on multiple occasions, but they always ended up reconciling. From the mid-90s to the early 2000s, Huntley worked a series of menial jobs. In 2001, he learned about a vacancy for a caretaker at Soham Village College. He had always aspired to be one since his father also worked as a school caretaker when he was young, so he sent an application. Wanting to hide his criminal past, Huntley applied under the name Ian Nixon. Because no background check was done, Huntley eventually landed the job. He and Carr then moved to Soham in September 2001. It was there that Huntley helped Carr get a job as a teaching assistant at St. Andrew's Primary School. When the police arrested Ian Huntley in the early hours of August 17, 2002, he refused to cooperate with the investigation. Days after his apprehension, he began exhibiting signs of mental illness. Police officers believed it was merely a ploy to avoid trial. Nevertheless, they sent him to the Rampton Hospital to be medically reviewed. Meanwhile, Carr readily confessed that she was indeed at Grimsby on the night of Holly and Jessica's disappearance. This time, her story was that Huntley let the girls in their house on August 4th, but this was only because Holly had a nosebleed and he tried to help. Carr then claimed that her boyfriend sent the two away afterward. The only reason they came up with their previous story was because Huntley was afraid he'd be falsely charged with what happened to the two. The investigators, however, were quick to debunk this account by showing Carr all the evidence they had against Huntley. These include his fingerprints on the bin where they found the victim's shirts. Carr then broke down in tears, still in denial about her boyfriend's involvement in the crime. And I'll tell you what else, forensically. His fingerprints have been found on the bag that Corrigan was in. Having obtained sufficient evidence against Ian Huntley, the Cambridgeshire police officially charged him with two counts of murder on August 20th, 2002. That same day, they also charged Maxine Carr with attempting to prevent the course of justice. By October 2002, experts determined that Huntley wasn't mentally ill. Consequently, he was relocated to Woodhill Prison, where he awaited trial. On June 9th, 2003, Jail wardens were alerted when prisoners found Huntley unconscious in his cell. It turned out he took 29 antidepressant pills in an attempt to end his life. However, he would be revived and returned to prison two days later. Thus, his trial began on November 5, 2003. Both Huntley and Carr entered a not guilty plea on all of their charges. Inside the coach behind those blinds is the court, the judge, the jury, the prosecution, and defense counsel for Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr. The center of CERM is closed today. It's become a court in session. For the first three weeks, the prosecution team presented strong circumstantial and biological evidence against Huntley. Several journalists who interviewed Huntley in August 2002 also took the stands to testify against him. Then on December 1st, 2003, Huntley was called into the witness box. While there, he admitted that the victims did die inside his house. However, he claimed it was an accident. He then narrated how he and the girls went to the bathroom because Holly's nose was bleeding. Since the bathroom floor was already wet, he slipped and accidentally knocked Holly into his bathtub. Jessica then started screaming upon seeing what had happened, so he panicked and covered her mouth tightly with his hands, but unintentionally suffocated her in the process. Huntley further remarked that he couldn't save Holly from drowning because he was preoccupied with Jessica. The prosecution, however, swiftly highlighted the absurdity of this narrative. The turning point in the trial came when Maxine Carr took the stands on December 4, 2003. During her cross-examination, Carr finally turned on her partner. With tears in her eyes, with her voice barely under control, Maxine Carr pointed a finger at the man she once yearned to marry and said she would not be blamed for what that thing had done. That thing, as she called him, 
was Ian Huntley. On December 10th, the prosecution and defense counselors delivered their closing remarks. Jury deliberation then began two days later. The verdict came out on December 17th, 2003. Maxine Carr was found not guilty of assisting an offender. However, she was sentenced to three and a half years in prison for preventing the course of justice. As for Ian Huntley, he was found guilty of all charges. He was sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment, with a minimum of 40 years behind bars. Killer of two young children, leaving the Old Bailey to begin two life sentences. In court number one today, there was evil, and its name was Ian Huntley. 16 months following the tragic demise of Jessica and Holly, justice was ultimately served. Following the sentencing, the Chapman and Wells couples held a press conference. I mean, our life sentence started last August. His is only just beginning. This case prompted British lawmakers to improve various Criminal Records Bureau system procedures. These include mandatory background checks for individuals applying to work with children. Years after the death of Jessica and Holly, the latter's father, Kevin Wells, became a founding patron of Grief Encounter. It's a charitable institution that helps families who have lost loved ones. In 2015, Wells participated in a fundraising walk along the Great Wall of China to support the charity. This event helped them raise over $70,000. To date, the organization has helped hundreds of families who have been through situations similar to the Wells and the Chapmans. Over two decades after their untimely deaths, the memories of Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells live on. So I think the thing that we need to remember from this case are the names of those two girls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. The little blonde girl, the little brown-haired girl, smiling for the camera in their football shirts and above them, the clock. And then they disappear and they're caught forever in that picture. The garden is quiet. The house is too, but pausing for a moment, we can still sense you. Your trusting nature and desire to please all allow us, your family, to remain walking tall. Our memories now shared with the nation's heart, small crumbs of comfort, now it is time to part. I am so terribly, terribly sorry for what I have done. The people are so something to the community. They trusted me. They gave me a job and a home. And I betrayed that trust in the worst possible way. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.